side. Don't tell me take the two Okay, uh, welcome uh, to our session of the 10th of November, first session. Uh, in fact, uh, the session is about uh, science, technology, innovation, SDG, and financial inclusion. And uh, I think we, it's good to separate the session into two parts. Uh, we will start by financial inclusion and SDG, uh, but we are not going to exclude science within uh, the talk of the first session. Uh, as you know, these three or four things they are interrelated, and we are trying to make as much as possible uh, interconnection between these issues uh, together. Uh, with me today is... Uh, Mrs. Olga. Mrs. Olga is, for, is from uh, Singinta Foundation. Uh, uh, she is the head of global uh, insurance solutions at Singinta Foundation and the chair of SCBF. Welcome, Mrs. Olga. In the middle, uh, his Excellency, Dr. Nasr Al-Qahtani, uh, a long experienced person, and he is now a CEO of Agfant, and we are very proud that he is with us today. And uh, we feel so humble uh, to be here as a uh, leader of the session while he is standing in the middle. So he is a knowledgeable person, and from him really we learned a lot of uh, practical experience in relation to SDG and, and financial inclusion. Uh, the third lady, which is not uh, the last, Mrs. Vir Vir Veronica Scotty. She is from the Swiss Tree. And by the way, uh, I just want, uh, before I start my questions, both of you to tell us one minute about your organization so that when you talk later, it will be very clear what you are doing and uh, start by uh, Oliga. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Brian. So Syngenta Foundation is, is acting as a catalyst. So I'm leading the insurance efforts. So we work through um, pre-commercial farmers, smallholder farmers in emerging markets. And we develop um, solutions feeding to those smallholder farmers. So the link with Ms. Koti, Mr. Nasar Katani, and myself is like we bring the dots together. So from the designing of the solution up to the link to credits, savings, other products, up to the reinsurer to take the bulk exposure of the risk. So Professor Ibrahim, and thank you everyone for having me today. Um, I lead the public sector solutions team at Swiss Re, uh, which is dedicated to bringing the best expertise the company is developing, wants to develop, uh, to solve protection gap issues around the world. And so um, my colleague, Swiss Re, is the largest, one of the largest reinsurers in the world. Uh, we're present in 64 countries, and we operate across all risks of, spe uh, of um, uh, risk spectrum, as Olga mentioned. So from very large industrial risks all the way to protecting uh, more vulnerable populations. And uh, our attachment, if you will, to the topic of financial inclusion comes from the fact that we recognize that still today, even when looking at natural, just simply uh, natural catastrophes, 
64% of the world is not protected. And if you look in life and health, the, that percentage is even higher. So we're looking into trillion of gaps in protection. And we know that by doing what we've always been doing, we won't be able to close this gap fast enough. So we have to collaborate with others, uh, address issues of affordability, of accessibility, of trust, of uh, fitness for purpose, and that's why we work together. Okay. So Nasser, maybe, maybe it's good to say a few words about ACFUND because you know some people here might not know anything about ACFUND. Yeah. ACFUND uh, is a vision of His Royal Highness, late Prince Talal. He was looking for sustainable development since the 70s. He believed in sustainable development. That's why when we create Ag Fund, we always look at things. Access include people in everything. Education, health, financial inclusion, higher education, etc. And the thing he always look at it, not just access, but as well as to be affordable cost. Like what you know, uh, 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 talking about that 60% of people not protected. Uh, be almost, you know, poor uh, people 100% is not protected. So we need to have access and affordable and sustainable. That's why Agfan, along with support uh, women and children without any discrimination, in five areas. And that's by the way, in the middle of 1995 when Agfund has an experience with 15 years and decide to say, okay, let's see what's need, what's a priority and challenge for the sustainable development. And we find out that this is a five area got to be developed, which is early shahid development, women empowerment, civil society, distant and open learning and financial inclusion. That five area have not been developed even in the advanced country they will be behind. So poor people in that five area at that time, they're not being included. Particularly when it's come to financial inclusion, that's why we are here talking about financial inclusion and sustainable development. And by the way, now everybody linking, you know, our work with SDGs and sustainable development. Agfan from the beginning align with sustainable development, no matter what you mention it. SDGs, uh, you know, millennium, you know, uh, goals or climate action. So the problem we're facing now is not just facing the poor people. Climate action is affecting everybody. Unemployment affecting everybody. Food insecurity now, even you know, advanced and developed and rich country has been affected. So go to the root you will find sustainable development is not there from the beginning. We will ask now, are we late? Yes. We, the, the, the alarm between us started mid-90s. We should have started in the 90s. That's why we link technology, financial inclusion with scientists. Sorry for the scientists. We didn't listen to you 20 years ago or 30 years ago. 1997, when everybody talking about Earth, Nobody was believing what science is saying. Today, we have to go back and review what science said. Otherwise, it will be late. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Voronika, if I spell it correctly. Yes, you did. A few minutes ago, she's telling me about uh, SDG, financial inclusion, technological innovations in two countries, Kazakhstan and Colombia. Can you tell us a little bit about this? You mean, how do we, how do we um, try to close the these gaps? Yeah. Yes. So, um, as I said, you know, you, you can take the best of the technology and the innovation in the world, but if it doesn't reach the people that need it, it's really not particularly useful. So one of the things, I'll, I'll tell a bit of a slightly longer story than just specific to transactions. One of the things that my team started to do uh, already um, about 10 years ago is to 
socialize the value of insurance with governments and public sector actors around the world because insurance is very much not understood. There is a trust issue, people don't, you know, it's complex, uh, contracts are difficult to, to read, and it's perceived as, um, I'm, I'm told at least in, in the Arabic world, right, that people rather say, uh, you know, inshallah, and hope for good, for good uh, things to come that by insurance, because you're bringing on yourself bad luck. And, um, and so you need to also understand in the norms, in the cultural norms of the population that you're working with, you know, how is the, your proposition being perceived? Um, so amongst other things, we um, helped found uh, about, I'm going to say eight years ago, the Insurance Development Forum, which is a public-private partnership platform. And it's really unique uh, at this point in the industry. It is the most important platform that exists uh, to establish a dialogue for execution of projects between the insurance industry, and Swiss Re was a founding member. Now there are over 30 companies that are part of that. The United Nations through the UNDP. The World Bank that is also a co-signee to this platform. And a number of governments that are either beneficiaries of the solutions that we'll bring to market or sponsors, financial sponsors of these activities. So they act as donors. And the Insurance Development Forum is present also at the COP uh, this year and last year. We, we were all here to, to um, socialize, to explain you know, the type of things that we're doing together to close the protection gap that I was mentioning before. So in this context, um, it was announced, for instance, one of the projects that we worked on is in Colombia. And we try to protect uh, small farm holders that are um, living in more remote areas because as for many parts of the world, you know, you have a lot of urban concentration. And by the way, there is a lot of urban poverty, city, in city poverty. And then in the surrounding areas, in, in many countries are very large and very uh, densely populated, but tends to be concentrated, you will find populations that, that have a problem of accessibility, they're not well connected, they don't have a way of taking their produce to market, etc. So, so they're a little bit more isolated. When we want to reach, even if we found the perfect solution that has you know, the, um, the right fit to the need of, let's say, um, uh, farm holders in Colombia, it's very difficult to reach them, to enroll them in these programs. So that's where working with governments and technology partners for us is essential because if you want to send agents, traditional insurance agents on the ground, it's going to be way too expensive and it's going to take a long time and the value of that cover per person is very, very small. So traditional insurance really does not work and that's why there is such a protection gap. So what we, what we design through this platform is rather than try and adapt a little bit the product, is to completely transform them, think creatively, and say, who do we, let's start with the people we want to reach. What is it that holds them back financially? As Nasser said, you know, what would give them more protection, peace of mind, allow their families and, and, and you know, kids to, to, to grow in, in a better off condition? And then you analyze those problems, and you have to find a delivery mechanism that is correct for that population. In the case of Colombia, we try to address specifically access. And so we needed a platform, which is technology, and that's why it's relevant to this session. A platform that allows us to do remote enrollment, validated against the national databases, and have immediate payment collection through the same platform, a premium and immediate payout based on what we call parametric triggers, so uh, fundamentally measuring rainfall, we were able to, um, to provide the payment within literally days, sometimes, you know, two, three days maximum. Why is this important? Because we can identify the people, but we can do it remotely. Uh, we use satellite data and remote data for the measurement of rain, which means that we don't have to do adjudication costs, 
so we don't have to send loss adjusters on the ground. And most critically, the farmers get the money within literally a few days, and that allows them to either replant or use, use it for you know, different cultivars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we use the technology partners. So this particular project was funded through the Insure Resilience Fund. Um, it's in partnership with the German government, therefore as a sponsor for the premium, uh, which takes care because they wouldn't have been able to afford it. The government of Colombia was involved, uh, so they know that once the pilot is up to scale, they need to be uh, rolling it out nationally, so that's their commitment. And so we're solving through this pilot, potentially we can reach millions of people and we use as a technology a, a, a technology from the global north, if you will, but they started off in the Caribbean, which is Raincoat, which is a startup, which I think is also fantastic because this way is not just big companies doing business for themselves, but we're actually building an ecosystem of players in the industry where everyone benefits, most importantly the farmers. Thank you. Uh, maybe a more general question to Dr. Nas. We all know that <clears throat> science and technology is an uh, indispensable tool for financial inclusion and uh, SDG achievement. Uh, my question, how science and technology related to climatic innovation can be helpful in the access of financial services and the enhancements of financial inclusion in general? Dr. Nasr. Yeah. Actually, uh, when you talk about science and the role of scientists, we have to add something, the role of scientists and the politician. Now, we add the private sector. So the three are involved whatever decision we make. And there is an influential to that. Science all the time gives the solution. If you give it to the business people, business people will make how much we make a profit out of that one and they might sometimes complicated to make it you know expensive at the beginning and by the time it would go 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 on and, and so the role of NGOs and politicians to make this is in a balance it depends on how do they look at it the way we look at it is very simple you know you know because uh, I'm going back to the root which goes poverty. Poverty is a complicated issue. There is a lot of things. So we always think about the solution. We come up with complicated solution. We want to make it so simple. The difficulty is facing the insurance. That's what we faced us 1995 when we we're talking about the credit. How can we reach people? This is too expensive. What we did, we did not complicate things. We said, okay, whatever the system is doing it, let's do the opposite. That we consider that at that time is innovation. System and bank was looking at, you know, uh, you know, rich people. So I think we will target poor people. They asked for collateral, we said, no collateral. So, you know, beneficiary will go to you, you go to the beneficiary. So you maximize the profit out of little effort. We make the margin is low and we outreach more. How can we do this complicated thing? We started with, at the beginning, you know, when we do microfinance, like what, what's happening now with the firm, we rely on the government. Government will not outreach. The government will make it complicated and make it expensive or the quality is not that much. So we need NGOs, they could do it, but they cannot be sustainable. MFIs, they could be sustainable, but they cannot grow. So we need the business. So the modality we come with it, we started with the MFIs. Nowadays, nowadays, I'm giving you an example, real example. We are in Yemen. 2009, we have the micro bank, it's not the MFI, micro bank. The bank at that time, when the crisis started, we have 17 branch and almost 1,000 agents. Now we have more than 4,000 agents in the ground. We have mobile you know, uh, payment, 
remittances, everything. The cost today became almost peanuts compared with this. I found it during the crisis. Cash disbursement in behalf of donors. We're talking about more than $1 billion. With a bank with a capital of $5 million, today this bank became one of the biggest four banks in Yemen. But the modality we use in it, we get the best out of the three we made. Profit, which is a company, our company, but no dividend, so the best of the NGOs. Solve a human problem, the best from the government. So the vehicle we use is a little bit different. Show private sector that work with the poor people will be profitable. So the problem you're facing today, we have the solution. Today, the cost, the cost of financing in Africa, almost 30%. I'm willing to give you 10% if you insure it. So embedding, that will take cost from 30% to less than 20, if I have an insurance. So I'm willing to give now the insurance company 10% of my portfolio, because I'm sure within a year, they will accept 1%, because the default rate is almost one or two. So this is something, you know, our problem all about science doesn't talk to the business people. Business people doesn't talk to NGOs. NGOs doesn't talk to the government. Nobody talking to any, and everybody. So whatever we have it in front of us, we need access, you know, the, the, no matter what. Cost got to be affordable. If it's not affordable, why, why should we do it, you know, now how to protect people? And then be sustainable. We cannot say, give it as a charity and government get to be grant. No. If people in the safe net, I'm giving them the safe net with $100, just leave $10 for the safe net. I'm all kind of insurance. Today, the commercial bank would not give you loan unless they embed the ins life insurance in your bank. Why don't we do it now? If we put all kind of insurance, because poor people doesn't know what you're talking about. So when Sanjenta and Agfan went to Sudan, Nobody imagined that we could have the product of micro insurance linked with the weather index. We just shared with you, it cost us a couple of thousand, two thousand dollars, two hundred thousand dollars or something. And now our bank have a, uh, almost, uh, how many? Half a million trained. Fifty, uh? Half a million trained people. Uh, trained people, and they became aware of how important the insurance is. As you know, uh, you mentioned and that people doesn't know about it because people does, doesn't understand what you're talking about. It. People, for God's sake, 2.5 billion people not been included in the financial system. They don't know what bank is. So how can we, you talk about insurance. People now having this, and even when we start even including them, we said, aha, uh -huh. we include them with non-banking. Non-banking system is include poor people. Banking is not included them. Even the central bank want to include people, but not through bank. You have to have a license non-banking. So why do you do this? This is a micro bank. Should be given full of legend in that one. So, uh, doctor, the, the way uh, you, you present the question, that we need science, but we don't need science to complicate it. Because our kids and ourselves, nobody teach us science. We, do not, we hate science. That's the way our school, our teacher, make us hate science. No, 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 because the way they, because we want to educate our kids to love science. No, 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 that's, that's, that's the mentality. You know, ask your kids now, say, ah, do you like science? He said, Oh, Dad, I don't like the class. Why? Nobody gives them access to science, preschool education, even before schools. Because 75% of our kids in the poor countries have no access to preschool education. How can they understand science? Yeah, thank you.
Okay, I think I will give you uh, later. I will give you uh, the floor to ask some questions in relation to what we are we are saying. Olga, I think I'm going to ask you the same question, but in a different way. I want an answer from your perspective. That is from uh, Dr. Nazis' perspective. Uh, what is the role of uh, science and technology and digital solution in designing insurance solution for financial inclusion? especially for small farmers? It's a general question. I think I would just <clears throat> agree totally with Veronica and, and Mr. Nasser. It's, it's, it's about co-creation. It's about uh, looking at things from a holistic perspective. Insurance won't work on a standalone basis, so we need to create system, bundles of solutions that they can leverage with each other. The same for partnerships. You know, we might need uh, to co-create these kind of solutions with a microfinance institution, with a regulator, you know, with an input provider, with a reinsurer. Everyone has a role to play. So it's, it's, it's time for really co-create together. And the most important is to find these kind of partnerships with the same vision and mission. And when Mr. Nasa and I took the first trip to Sudan, it was back in 2018, the country was in a critical situation. And we were thinking like, you know, we need to think to get out of the comfort zone and look at countries from another perspective. Give a helping hand, go and assess what, what are the needs in the country and what is the potential of the country. And then come up with a consortium of strong partnerships to really identify what can we done together. So three years down the road, it is true that through EBDA Bank, and our partnership, together with the support of the Swiss Capacity Building Facility, we have been uh, training almost half a million of smallholder farmers in Sudan, and Adil is, is here on the lead of EBDA Bank, and the sky is the limit. But it's now also the question of addressing what is the role of the government, because the government has also an important role to play. And we always discuss about as GDP rates are growing, the insurance penetration remains below 1%. And this is an issue that the government has to start addressing, right? So, so again, the bundling solution is helping to, to increase this kind of penetration rate, but we need to look at insurance, not only as a collateral, it's a de-risking factor on food production, and not only at the smallholder farmer level, but also at the financial level. So we need to see at the value of the insurance side as, as a, let's say, a de-risking factor and not only as the perception that we do have in our world, like, is a greedy business. It is not. So we need to change that word, maybe, to transform the full meaning of, of what insurance is all about. Yeah, I like the idea, by the way. I've been talking with Olga about this just uh, when we are uh, in the entrance. And I like the idea of inclusive services. In the past, people have been looking at insurance as if it is an isolated activity that has got nothing to do with finance, especially for the vulnerable groups. Nowadays, the idea of inclusive financial services uh, makes uh, insurance uh, uh, as if it is, it is an integral part. It is, it, is, it is not less than financing, not less than saving not less than any other financial activities that we can render to small uh, farmers and, and vulnerable group. This uh, is a very interesting and I think, I think it's a new concept and, uh, and we have to work in order to consolidate it uh, all over the world. Uh, I'm going back to Voronik. You know, young people can change the world through science and technology. So my question is, what type of encouragement and uh, support your organization uh, made for the talented young people, uh, uh, scientists in developing new climatic insurance solutions? Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. So I, I will declare my passion for science. What can I do? I, I always enjoyed it. My children are in school, at university and they both um, have science degrees. But, uh, but I understand that science can be intimidating. And so um, 
maybe I'll give you a, a few parts answers. So I have a personal affiliation, therefore, you know, that's what we, we talk at home with my children, with my nieces, et cetera, et cetera. So that's that. But more on a professional side, um, as an organization, we can do what we do successfully if we use science smartly. I don't know how much of you know about the reinsurance business, but we fundamentally, you can look at us as the, the equivalent of a central bank. We protect insurance companies all over the world. And so the specificity of reinsurance is that we have to be very, very solid, financially strong, to take, when things go really, really bad for the insurance companies or for a large corporate or for a government, we have to be financially very solid because we have to pay, and we have to pay a lot. If you take the example of COVID, Swiss Re paid over five billion throughout COVID, just for COVID losses between life and health and PNC and public uh, and, and, and property and casualty um, exposures that we had. Right. So you look at Hurricane Ian that just went through Florida. And, that is over 60 billion loss to the industry estimated. And we're gonna, we've, we've announced a few weeks back that we will pay 1.2 billion. That's what we expect to be paying out of it. So this is a lot of money. So how do we do this? The reason why we operate in this space is because we operate what we call entailed risks. So there are things that you can expect and you can plan around. When you can plan around these things, you can also mitigate the risks, right? You wouldn't put uh, a bush next to your house if you know that you're at risk of wildfires. You have to move those bushes away from your property because if an ember goes on it, not only the bush catches fire, your entire house burns down. So this is what individuals can do to risk mitigate. And then they can buy insurance once they've done the right mitigation actions, and then insurance aggregate all of the risks and come to us. And we are at the most concentrated, the most extreme scenarios, that's where we operate. So given this little lesson about reinsurance before, what we have to be good at is project these scenarios over many, many different, uh, you know, potential situations. And we have to be able to do this, whether it's very frequent or very infrequent. Sometimes we go 100 years, 200 years. So for us, science is at the core of what we do. If we don't use the scientific method, our business model falls apart completely. So in Swiss Re, we, we, we hire scientists to develop our own models. Uh, we have in-house uh, capabilities for climate development models, for instance. And, um, and this is a choice that's quite unique in the industry. So we collaborate a lot with academia and whatnot. But we also use science to solve the issues that we've discussed right now. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, you know, in another country, in Kazakhstan, we wanted to help farmers, but we had the issue of identification. And there was no comfort in the insurance value chain that we could make it work if we couldn't have certain identification of payment to avoid fraud, to avoid money going to the wrong groups, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so uh, we introduced a blockchain technology that we helped develop. But you can only do it if you have scientists that are data scientists. Data scientists today are not attracted well, I hope they're more attracted after our projects, but they typically tend to go to big tech companies, right? And they don't think about the insurance industry. I think we've done quite some work to explain that what we do is to protect populations. It's really impact, impactful in, in very meaningful ways. And by coming and working with us, they can make a difference. But I realized that, for instance, women statistically speaking, are ever less data scientists. So when I was CEO for my company in Canada, I launched an initiative which is Women in STEM. And I want to share it with this group because I think it's an example of how you go over and beyond what Olga was talking about before. Women were dropping off STEM education and as a STEM you know, alumni, I felt, why? Why is this happening? I want to have a diverse 
team in my office. I don't want just men. I want women. I want people of color. I want, you know, people with different backgrounds. So, but they were not being represented. Universities were not pushing out that type of profile. The scientist was becoming ever more male and white. And, and so we launched this initiative and I knew that I could only hire maybe 30, 40 people. We needed hundreds in the industry. So we, I created a coalition with other insurance companies in Canada. Today, this is it's gone from three to, I think, you know, two dozens. Became an award. I've, I've long left Canada, but I'm so glad my successor just received an award for going, growing and building this coalition. And we go and pick students from university from very diverse backgrounds that are passionate about science. We guarantee them internships for three years across not just Swiss Re, but any of the insurance companies that are part of the coalitions. They're guaranteed the same salary and very interesting projects because we want their intellect, their creativity, their passion to change the world to be applied in our space. And we make them owners of these projects. And I can tell you, it's a beautiful story because it's a story of retention of, of diverse talents within the industry that are qualified to do the job that we want them to do, but they also develop an entrepreneurial mindset. And uh, can I give another couple of examples? Just because I think it's very important. Uh, to, develop, to develop the solutions ever more as skills, Swiss Re launched for its, own, for its employees that, are, that show a clear inclination and passion. Doesn't matter, you don't have to have an IT background. You have to say, I'm willing to learn. We have the ADA Fellowship, which is a two-year training on tech uh, with the best companies and educators in the world, so that, but they have to apply to real-life problems. That's something that we do for our employees. The third example that I would offer, and then I'm, I pass on because I'm sure others have to say, but I'm very excited about it. We also have a foundation, the Swiss Re Foundation, and I work with the foundation on the Entrepreneur for Resilience Award. And what I'm passionate about is that we can work to bring solutions to market with social entrepreneurs, very similar to what Nasser and Olga were mentioning before. Social entrepreneurs are at the core of the functioning of the economies where inclusiveness is a problem. They are very connected to those communities. But we sponsor through our program and it's, you know, they get a million and three years of support and access to additional funding through venture capitalists. So it's a lot of money that Swiss Re has been paying for a decade now. This program to me is beautiful because they have to be technology minded so they need to bring technically scalable solutions to their realities and we run it thematically and currently we're running a life and health theme and we've already um, homegrown if you will and, and supported uh, nine, fam you know, a gener three generations of social entrepreneurs that use technology to solve the problems in their communities. And that, what that has created is exposure for the Swiss Re teams that for three years work with them to work together to the point that now our global head of data scientists wants to launch a special initiative for social entrepreneurs permanently where we do joint training. So I think these are ways we can make a difference also as a company. is uh, for Mr. Nasser again. Uh, being uh, 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 an economist who really specializes in, in financial inclusion and uh, microfinance and being part of ACFIN for the last uh, five years or so, uh, I really feel that ACFIN is doing unprecedented, uh, you know, development in terms of uh, that they are trying to have programs, bankable programs, bankable products out of the 17 SDGs. And this is really, I feel it is uh, one of the most important uh, development ACFAD has made. Uh, they took the SDGs, they look seriously, they try to find bankable, 
you know, products for uh, vulnerable groups, small farmers, especially in uh, digitalization, in solar energy, and in, in any other fields. I mean, Mr. Nasser, really this is a neglected area. A lot of people, they don't know that ACFAND is doing very well in this direction. Can you tell us more about that? What I start, you know, telling about science, you know, when, when the kids say hey, it is science, that's the way we want science to be taught in our school and encourage our kids from the beginning to know science. The example, you know, you show for your kids, that's where we need, you know, schools in the poor country being advanced to encourage those poor people to like science, because this is one of the way we educate them. So, the modality you have, that's what AgFund, you know, align it with the SDGs. We use in science, we use in the, those people. Without science, we would not even achieve this. But we want it to be, you know, uh, you know, easy for, you know, normal people to understand the calculation and the link with the insurance. Poor people didn't know what, what, what insurance is. If, you, if, if we talk about the risk and de-risking, and we, we take them in an area, it needs time to even understand the concept. That's why Agfund is using Swissery, uh, Sangenta, our partner, United Nations, where we look at the SDGs. By the way, when we look at the 17 goal, we start from the bottom, from starting with the partnership, 17. We, 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 uh, we take it from uh, 17 to number one. If you start with 17, with a partnership, private sector, sector, and you take your modality together with effort solution, and you go for goal by, by goal, you found yourself when you reach number two, which is, you know, zero hunger, you don't need to go to poverty because Poverty as number one is not a cause, it's a result. It's outcome. Our problem, we stick with number one and we do nothing. But if we start it upside, backward, we start with partnership, education. Imagine that everybody have a good education because some people want to have education. But it's not affordable. Imagine now poor woman in Africa, she wants to have a certificate in science from Harvard or MIT, how much that would cost if we give her or give him a scholarship and they go there, they will not come back. When they graduated, they will get a job. And they, so Agfund, like that one, to give them, you know, just a little loan and have access to first class certificate, the British Open University now, Agfund partner with it. We have the university exists in the Arab region, nine countries. So people could have loans from Agfund and study, and it's, we're talking about $1,000 per year. Talk about 4,000, you get validated, accredited from the British Open University. So this is when it became affordable and they have financing and etc. They take women, poor women from being poor in Africa to be having a leading in their microfinance. So this is when one of the products, we, we, the way you use it, go number four, taking it to how nobody think that $1,000, even if you need it, nobody will give you a loan unless you give a scholarship. Second, when we started with it, when, and this is happening after COVID-19, what is the most effective goal among the 17? We found number two, zero hunger. That was after, right after COVID-19. That's why Agvan, the year before, we talked about small farmer because of food security. Even before the, uh, 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 what happened in Ukraine, everybody knows our food security is a threat in everybody. So small farmer today is 50% of the agriculture produced by a small farmer. Most of the small farmer in African poor country have no access to financial inclusion. 
Nobody even look at them as a micro enterprise. They always look at them as a poor people. So they need loan. They need to be have an account. They need to be the best seat. They need micro insurance. Nobody developed it. That's why we are in Sudan. We have one center. Small farmer could go there and have loan, micro insurance, the best seed, link with supply chain, all this is together. And the cost is going down. That's where we need Swissly come and look at what we're doing in Sudan, for example, and how can we make it bigger for whole Africa. Imagine, because we know they cannot, they cannot but through my uh, MFIs, you could even decide I will be reaching one million small farmer in Africa. That number, it's reachable. Nobody would think supply chain, insurance, bank, they would not think that they could reach one million. No, we could through MFIs. Because if, if, if one MFI could reach 100,000, so that's more people. So that's why Agfund, when they design their product, they always look at what this product could achieve that one. Of course, we're financing women, you know, we, we have the kindergarten school, preschool education. Uh, this is one of the products in, uh, in Sudan. We finance women to open a kindergarten and a nursery. We have now more than 1,000 kindergarten in Sudan, uh, creating almost 1,000 job opportunities. Yeah, uh, that's how Agfund look at whatever we do, it has to be aligned with one of the SDG because all of this interrelated. But mainly, to be honest, that the, you know, uh, the policy maker and the regulator should look at microfinance to be incorporated with the climate act. It's working now. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, before I give the floor the chance to comment, to add, to ask questions, uh, the last question will be for Olga. Olga, you know uh, SCBF and uh, strategic alliances or, uh, have achieved a lot with regard to small farmers de-risking in many countries. Can you tell us about uh, the countries you are working on and what is your future expectation uh, in order to enhance this, this type of uh, de-risking de to small farmers? The Swiss Capacity Building Facility is acting in 32 countries, mainly emerging markets. And now we work together with a strong support for the Swiss Development Corporation. So there is an eligible list of countries where, where, where to go. Um, we believe that there are many countries still not included, and we are here for an inclusive approach. So the way forward would be really to think beyond, you know, the, always the countries we try to talk about every time, every time, and to include others. Like an example would be Sudan, for instance. Now, with the support of the Swiss Development Corporation, what we are looking into really try to do the max as we can. But again, it takes the trip together in collaboration with our partners. SDC is not here just to tell us where to go. So we need more partners coming on board to really leverage our funds, our strategic power, our technical approaches, and to develop those resilience inclusive solutions to deserve all these countries that they are not yet included and for those countries 
really we want to, to serve. So being in this COP is for us an opportunity to think about the next COP, COP28, which is also going to be in, in the Arab region. And we really need to think about how do we go to countries like Mr. Nasser used to say, when are we going to Syria? When are we going to Sierra Leone? When are we going you know, to all the geographies that they are not yet included into the agenda? So. <laughs> Yeah, I hope uh, for SCDF a very good success in the future. I think they are doing a very good job and I think time is not enough to explain what all the things they are doing. Now I will leave the floor to ask some questions. I think you, you asked for something you want to add? Really? Ah, oh, okay. Please come. What's his name? Elias? Oh, Elias. Elias, uh, I think... Really? Elias, I think we have been talking about different issues. And I think I will leave you to mesh out and talk from your own perspectives. All right. And, and if you have any additions... Okay. Please, you are welcome. Sorry for... All right. Uh, thank you very much and uh, um, honored to be here. Uh, it was great to listen in to NASA and uh, Olga and also my colleague, Veronica. And, and basically, based on the comments that I've had, uh, there are three critical components that are being mentioned. Uh, if you want to create an inclusive, um, innovative, resilience ecosystem, there are various factors that need to be blended together. So, for instance, uh, what His Excellency Nasser was mentioning uh, corresponds towards creating a value chain that will enable that inclusive, innovative, and resilience ecosystem. So, for instance, he mentioned the need of credit in a more accessible format, the need of really enabling the people that are going to provide this particular credit to see how easy and how it can be de-risked from the farmer's perspective. On top of that, then, it needs to complement in terms of how do we build resilience in those particular communities. For instance, insurance becomes a critical tool to enable that. And that's why you see with the, uh, with the Gender Foundation and the Swiss Re, uh, Reinsurance, it enables creation of that particular resilience uh, platform. So over time, we've been working uh, with the with AgFund and, and together with the Sigenda Foundation. And the key thing that we've been asking ourselves is how then do we create this ecosystem? How then do we create this inclusive, um, innovative uh, ecosystem? And, and that really brings three other components that need to come in. One thing is that how do we enable demand for these particular products? How do we enable rightful supply of these particular products? But also how then do we ensure that there is an enabling environment. And for that, all these particular players have to come with one conclusive goal. Because the, con the goal is food security and inclusion. You cannot enable a, a, a community to be food secure if you've not enabled them to become bankable. So there's need to create bankable projects. And we've worked uh, together in a very robust bankable project in Sudan, whereby we've seen a community being moved uh, from exposure to climate-related risks to a more resilient ecosystem. So whereby the farmers are enabled to access loans, the farmers are enabled to access insurance products, and these particular farmers are going to ensure that uh, that particular community is transformed towards resilience. And that is something that all of us need to do. We need to really look at how then supply becomes, easy, accessible, and quick, because a farmer will not have time if you really need to take him through a very en elongated process. The second thing is, um, is the demand. And demand can only be created through affordable products. Affordable product means that how then do you bring all these players together? The last thing is, is regulation. I know you've been working closely within the regulatory front, and you know how much friction regulators can cause to prevent a very conclusive, innovative product. 
I usually say that I've worked as a regulator before. We, they are not the interesting people that you'd want to meet. Most of the time, and, and we do understand them, a, a, a regulator from his own perspective is looking at consumer protection. He's not concerned with, with market development. And that's why on this COP, there's need to ensure that we enable these regulators to become part of the ecosystem. Most of the time, they play outside the field. They always observe whether are we going towards food security, they'll be observing. Are we going to ensure that innovation and uh, we create supportive products, they'll be observing. So what we need to do, and, and this is something that we've worked with SCBF uh, together with the Syngenta Foundation and together with Ag Fund, whereby we developed uh, what we call Bima Lab, and we were honored to have Syngenta Foundation to be the first company to basically participate in Bima Lab. And what did we do, what did we do with, with Syngenta Foundation? They managed to create what we call a resilience engine. Now, what this, that, does this resilience engine do? It enables farmers to look at the entire value chain and support the basic needs of a farmer. And within that, with that particular innovation, basically taken through the, our acceleration program, they have managed to implement that in, in, in other countries, for instance, Sudan, whereby right now we are talking of about 10,000 farmers and really growing. And, and I, I really like uh, what uh, the, uh, the bank is doing to support these particular farmers. At the same time, this particular product has even gone beyond Africa, basically developing resilience among communities. For us to address the issues of climate change, we must create an inclusive, innovative, resilient ecosystem. And that will only be enabled by working with all of us as partners. And it's, I'm honored to basically work with His Excellency Nasa Al-Katani. We've been working with Ms. Olga to really accelerate the push for these particular products in Africa. Thank you. Commenting on, uh, thank you very much, Ferris. Commenting on your uh, issue of regulator, uh, Mr. Nasr al Ghattani is always telling me that the best regulator is the one who is coming from financial inclusion domain. And if we manage to get a financial inclusive uh, uh, you know, central bank regulator, I think things are going to go into the right direction. Do you believe in that? <laughs> yeah, as we mentioned, and, and this is something that we've been working closely also in, in Africa, whereby we developed uh, what we call risk uh, resilience uh, regulatory lab. And, and this is just to ensure that the regulator becomes part of the ecosystem. As I said earlier, most of the time regulators are sitting outside of the field. They want the ball to be played. They want the game to reach the conclusive winning end. But they're not part of that particular game. They're, they're just observing the game. And for that to happen is that we need to enable them to join this particular challenge that we are facing. We, will know, we know that climate risk is a real issue. And it cannot happen without inclusive, innovative products. We know very well they need capacity. We need to ensure that they get that particular capacity. We want them to see beyond consumer protection because that's what they are, they are, they are, they are basically paid to do. I'm paid to ensure that the customer is happy. But I'm not paid to ensure that this particular customer is able to get a newer, innovative, accessible product in the future. So we need to enable them to do that. So it, it's very good that if we can create that ecosystem and enable these particular players to work together with partners such as banks, partners such as insurance companies, partners such as innovators, young people, universities, technological institutions, uh, mobile operators, then we are going to create a very good resilient ecosystem in the future. You want to add something, Mr. Nasser? <laughs> Thank you, Elias. That's, that's correct, you know. Central bank and the regulator always look at how to protect people, which is they have the right. But we want them to go and look at how can we do sustainable development. Sustainable development in a world get lost because private sector want to, you know, do something, but they always want to have, you know, uh, how can we make profit quickly? which is they have the right because the investor will incur it. So we need, we need something in between because we've been the last 20 years 
you know, when we started even having, uh, you know, even um, financial inclusion include the, in, the in the system, 20 years ago, central bank said, no, they cannot be part of it. So that, that's why central bank now and all banks start doing the, what they call uh, sandbox. Because the innovation run as an experimental done by a private sector, they show a success. So we need the mindset. The mindset of the people look at it and yes, I could make a profit, but make a profit with few people or big uh, number of people. This is where when we look at uh, environment, social uh, governance, not just how much percentage, this is very important of women, no. How many people you include in your product? How many people you make your product affordable in the people in the remote area? So this is a kind of issue need to be educated to the uh, you know, private sector to look at it that way. So central bank, no, 20 years ago is not the same as today. Now they want to be included with, you know, because uh, thinking now payment, remittances, that solves 90% of the problem. If you use payment, electronic and digital, why you are poor, you know that you already you almost make them 5% because now when you using a payment electronic, they give you back 5% or something, incentive. That's one of the way, you know, if you are in the safe net and you get $10, that means if you spend it electronically, you might get $12. Which $12, the $12, if you pay it, you might even get an insurance in that area, in one of the... Uh, area if you if the insurance will be as low as that one so we want to be able to be inclusive with the protection of course we need to protect people but the system got to be go on otherwise you know poor people will be excluded i do agree i think i'll give you the chance now if uh, for a quick question one or two yes please uh, thank you so much for this comprehensive knowledge uh, and I would like just to comment on final word from Elias. I guess it's more or less related to uh, building, uh, to build a resilient community. We need first, as Mr. Nasser uh, indicated, to change the mindset. Uh, if we uh, succeed in changing the mindset from the beginning and include science in all the operation, as Veronica said, we would like to have like uh, a specific local experiment because uh, the solution in Colombia cannot be working in Egypt. We need to develop local successful examples. And to do so, we need first to change the mindset and also to, to raise the awareness to the banking sector. Because in Egypt, for example, nowadays, they started to do uh, what we call it uh, climate-associated risks. If they are trying to do a lending process for any project, they have first to uh, uh, do a listing for the project and see if the risk uh, with climate is high or uh, low, then they are going to approve or to reject the loan. So it's all about knowledge. And as Mr. Nasser said, it's like the triangle need to have like a common language between the politicians, between the scientists, and at the end between the business. Uh, to find a viable, resilient, innovative solution. Thank you, Elias. Yeah, I, I really appreciate uh, what he has mentioned. And um, if you look at what he was talking about, is that we need to think about what we call responsive models. Now, what do I mean by responsive models? We, we need to look at uh, an ecosystem that will focus on the needs of these particular communities. You know, most of the time you'll get that you'd want to really fix a model to the community, even though they might not really have that need that uh, they have at that particular moment in time. So we need to create very responsive models that will kind of focus on their needs and build that and respond to various changes that they are going to have in the future. And how then do we do that? We need to ensure that we uh, use the ecosystem that is around them. If it's education system, how do they really manage those particular risks at the moment? Because most of the time you'll get that 
you want to create a very formalized risk management transfer mechanism, but these people have already an existing informal ecosystem that we might just need to modernize it and enable them to use it in a more efficient and appropriate way. So what I would say is that it is very difficult to pick one solution and kind of push it to another different community. The key thing is that we ensure that the models and the responsiveness of these particular communities is within the needs that they need to be addressed. And that basically means that this particular needs to be uh, customer focused, they need to be centric to these particular people, but at the same time we need to ensure that as these particular people evolve uh, out of that particular ecosystem, most of the time we call it sustaining innovations, that particular component really moves with them because if you provided a risk resilient solution in, in a community, you don't expect them to remain at the same level. So as Mr. Nasser uh, said earlier, these particular people will have a certain level of earning. As you build resilience on that, they'll kind of improve their earning. So the, the product also needs to move with them rather than remaining at the same place. So responsiveness is a key thing that we need to ensure, but also it will, it's not an, an issue whereby an, 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 an all-fits-all approach needs to be applied. It must be uh, proportional to those particular people, but also responds to their, their current needs. Thank you. Thank you. I hope we can continue. It's a very interesting discussion, I think, and uh, we have to stop here. Elias, Veronica, Nasir, Olga, Thank you very much. Thank you for coming and joining with us. It is interesting. Uh, before we leave, I think we, we need to have a common, I mean, uh, join the photo.
طيب اوكي ذيس از ا سكند سيشن وذ ريجارد تو ساينس تكنولوجي انوفيشن فاينانشال انكلوجن اند اس دي جي ذا فيرست سيشن واز مينلي Uh, on the financial inclusion and SDG uh, with, a, with some hints here and there uh, with science and technology. I think this is going to be mostly uh, science and technology because those uh, gentlemen who are sitting uh, beside me, they are more or less scientists more than uh, practitioners in uh, financial inclusion. First of all, in order for the audience uh, to know what do we mean by when we talk about science, technology, innovation in relations to climatic change. We want to explain the concept as well as the relationship before we start asking questions. It's an open question. Hello. Okay. So thank you very much. So my name is Arkan Tarkush. Uh, I'm from University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. So basically regarding your question, uh, the relationship between actually climate change and also science and technology and so on. Uh, so I think from my perspective, if you think about climate change, actually it is mainly a scientific problem rather than other type of problems because If it's a financial problem, then we could have solved tomorrow. We just pay $1 trillion, dollars and then there is no climate change anymore. So as you see, you know, the fundamental of the problem is coming from science. So that means that we need to apply scientific actually approach to solve the scientific problem. So in our case, for instance, uh, so we are trying to actually mitigate the effect of this particular problem by implementing renewable energy technologies. So this can be, for example, offshore wind, or this can be floating solar and so on. But, you know, this is not the only solution. So basically now scientists proposing many different approaches around the world. So basically all together, we will try to solve this problem. And also, you know, we are all scientists. You know, we also know that we cannot get the solution tomorrow as well. So it will take time, so it will, yes, we need to be a little bit more patient. But, you know, once we put all the efforts in a sincere way, so I believe that, you know, we can resolve this problem in a reasonable amount of time. So thank you. Very good. Uh, my name is uh, Osama Salem, and um, I'm an endowed chair professor uh, in civil, um, uh, sustainable civil infrastructure. I'm also the head of the Civil, uh, Environmental, and Infrastructure Engineering Department at uh, George Mason University. Um, my, uh, my interest and my research focuses more on uh, the uh, infrastructure asset management 
civil like infrastructure from roads, um, uh, bridges, uh, and um, tunnels, and so on. Um, when we talk about climate change and the financial aspect of climate change, we touch on this um, uh, clearly. When we manage the um, infrastructure assets throughout their service life. Um, usually, when we design, when we plan, design, and um, construct uh, uh, infrastructure, we look at the initial cost, and this is not good. We take it a step further, and we, we look at the life cycle costing, the, the maintenance, the operation side of the, um, uh, the, the infrastructure. Um, then, recently, we started to look into the sustainability aspect and the triple uh, bottom line when it comes to evaluating alternative designs as well as alternative construction methods, uh, materials, um, uh, site selection, all of these. Um, and look into the risk analysis side, taking in consideration the social, economics, and the environmental side. This is very important, uh, but it comes with a cost, and you need to make a case to the uh, clients and the contractors to justify selecting more expensive choice initially. So that we're, we're life cycle costing and um, uh, 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 energy savings over the throughout the life of the of the project of, of the infrastructure system or the building comes to place, and that's the case. We have the burden to show and provide to the clients that the green and sustainable choice not necessarily more expensive, and if it is more expensive initially, it is uh, can show savings through the life. Uh, of the infrastructure or the building. Uh, thank you, Mr. Berz. Um, my name uh, is uh, uh, Islam Amin. I am a professor at uh, Strathclyde University and Borsaid University as well. Uh, my research focus on um, marine renewable energy. Uh, my background is uh, naval architecture and marine engineering. So, um, from uh, more than 10 years, I focus uh, mainly on uh, marine renewable energy, uh, like um, uh, offshore wind turbines, uh, um, uh, wave converters, and all of this uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, marine tech. Uh, I am also a director uh, uh, of Consultant Engineering Bureau in uh, UK and uh, uh, Egypt, as uh, this like consulting uh, uh, bureau uh, gives solution or smart solution regards to uh, marine construction and renewable energy. Um, regards to your question, it's a very uh, nice question. The relation between uh, uh, climate change and uh, uh, science and technology and innovation. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, um, um, actually, in, in the same statement, the problem and solution. Uh, we face huge uh, um, uh, challenge due to, uh, and this is a problem, climate change. And at the same time, I believe that uh, the solution will be in the uh, science and technology and innovation. Uh, I think uh, uh, nothing capable to uh, sort out this problem uh, without uh, science. Um, actually, um, without science aid, we can't predict uh, the future. We can't predict what happened related to renewable energy in future. So if we don't know what will happen, how can we offer solutions? So the science also depend on the prediction and the modelings. Uh, can offer uh, solution for future, uh, and as uh, my colleague uh, Professor Arkan mentioned, uh, climate change not uh, 
uh, only current problem but future problem. So uh, uh, we need to treat with this problem with future uh, vision. Uh, only science and research and technology can offer the solutions. The, the uh, uh, coming technology and uh, future vision only coming from research. Uh, this is my point of view. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, thank you so much for having me here. I'm uh, Tariq Timroz, uh, Professor of Marine Chemical Ecology and Director of Erasmus uh, Master Degree on Climate Change Management at uh, Suez Canal University. Uh, simply to answer your uh, tricky and hard to solve uh, problem, it's simply like this. It's all about carbon. Actually, what we are uh, trying to do is uh, can be shortened in we have surplus of carbon in the atmosphere and we are uh, trying to capture all of this carbon. So between the surplus and the capture, it's our story. All of our actions, uh, 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 living uh, scenarios, activities are connected with uh, producing uh, carbon and releasing carbon in the atmosphere. So we have four uh, words related to carbon. Carbon emission, carbon reduction, carbon offsetting, and finally with the banking sector we have carbon trade. So it's, it's a magnificent word nowadays. And from the beginning it's uh, the story connected to science. Uh, back to the work of uh, Roland and Molina in 1970s, a uh, couple of uh, researchers, they think about what is going on uh, uh, on the uh, high atmosphere with the release of uh, CFC. And someone saying, you know, the CFC does not have any problem with the ozone layer. And the other, it was a debate at that time. And they think about how they can do an invention in that time. So from the beginning, it's connected to identify the climate problem with the invention. So both of them trying first to develop a mechanism or on the ground, he can measure the depletion of ozone uh, 10,000 meters away. And th when they succeeded, both of them, they transformed into what is called now uh, ozone depletion material. And for the recognition of this marvelous work, both of them won a Nobel Prize after 20 years of hard work in 1995. So it's all centered and surrounded by science. And all of our activities nowadays in every single aspect is connected to either how to reduce the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, how to enhance the water quality of the seas and ocean to capture more carbon, how to do a, a regenerative agriculture to reduce and absorb more carbon, how to uh, uh, sink the carbon and capture the carbon and not related back to the environment. It's simply around carbon. And this is uh, uh, crystallized to the science uh, relation in every aspect. Thank you. Can you observe that the four answers, they are integrating and, and solve this uh, questions uh, in a different perspectives. Thank you very much. Uh, I will continue with this uh, open question. I think it is good for the scientists you know, to ask uh, uh, somebody a specific questions while the other another question. Uh, with regard to uh, uh, an effective and sustainable response uh, uh, to climatic change, demand the best and up-to-date scientific approach uh, especially in the area of research and uh, innovation. I think the old-fashioned type of science and innovation cannot work for the coming future. What do you think about that? Is it true or not? <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for the question. So, so you are right, basically, in a sense that you know we need to develop new technologies rather than relying on the old ones. At the end of the day, you know, as we were just mentioning, there are different ways to tackle this particular problem. And from our perspective, for instance, you know, we are trying to implement these uh, renewable energy technologies. 
So, you know, these technologies have been around, you know, for a long amount of time. So basically, if they were working properly in the past, so I think the problem has already been, been resolved. So it means that, you know, even the existing technologies, they require further development. So, so currently, for instance, if you look at, for instance, the Mindanao technology, now we are somehow changing our strategy by locating wind turbines rather than onshore to offshore. Why? Because now we have much better resources when we go to offshore. And also we can have much bigger wind turbines we having larger capacities and so on. So basically, at the end of the day, you know, we have a very big problem to solve, but also at the same time, you know, we need to improve our basically methodologies and technologies to somehow reach the same level of the problem itself. So basically, I think it's natural that we need to make more and more improvements so that we can basically achieve what we would like to achieve. Thank you. Yeah, very good question. And uh, again, I'm going to uh, refer to some uh, applications and implementation in the civil engineering infrastructure uh, world. Um, for example, again, um, even in the education technology, um, like we have senior projects at George Mason University. The students have to design and plan for um, a comprehensive infrastructure project. We include sustainability and technology like BIM, for example, building information models. I don't know if you heard this term before or not, but it's, it's a platform that takes the design to a 3D animated world. Not only that will embed the schedule and the progress of the job so you can visualize the progress of the project before it starts during the planning uh, phase and connects that with the cost as well as the energy part which important part of sustainability to optimize the energy in, used by a building for example and also keep all these records for operation and maintenance for an asset management exercise and asset management uh, um, of, of the building or of, of, the, of the infrastructure system. Um, sensors and uh, AI data analytics play a very important role in the real world nowadays. Connecting sensors to a bridge and continuously monitoring the, uh, uh, the, the, the performance and deterioration and issues with the bridge and developing um, a digital twin that can really kind of uh, mirror the real bridge so you can, ha you can, do, you can make better decisions, more efficient decisions and lengthen the life of the bridge which at the end reduces emission because you don't have to reconstruct or uh, uh, spend like put more resources into major uh, rehabilitation or major repairs. Uh, so definitely technology can very much add uh, value in, in terms of uh, reducing the impacts of or reducing emissions and, and reducing uh, the impact on climate change. So. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, about this question. Um, again, uh, uh, this is a question uh, take round around the same uh, topic, the innovation technology uh, and science and the relation with climate change uh, and uh, the old-fashioned and uh, new technology. Uh, actually, the, the, the definition of technology that it's uh, create or innovate something new for humanity. Uh, and uh, uh, this happened because the current technology or the old-fashioned technology not enough to solve, solve out our problems. Uh, 
so uh, the technology trait with um, uh, uh, problem statement and uh, define this statement or this problem and uh, uh, because this problem happened uh, because the current technology is not enough to sort out so we need further or more uh, things to do uh, to sort out this. Uh, regards to our speciality in uh, marine technology uh, we're looking for a future. Um, we offer a lot of uh, solutions for climate change. Uh, and uh, because it's need uh, more technology and investment, it's, it's uh, slowly pro progressing, actually, uh, compared to the onshore technologies. As my colleague mentioned, um, because of our speciality, we transfer from onshore turbine to offshore turbine. Offshore turbine uh, can add five times production more than onshore. But why we don't, uh, for example, beginning to protect this uh, future technology rather than uh, uh, built and built onshore? Because this, this, uh, this is the way of world work. Uh, something uh, uh, in your hands you want to uh, take all potential before you uh, transfer to a future technology um, if, if this video it's interest for you this uh, some of our uh, research projects i think i will give you a chance to show the video after yeah, after we yeah, finish yeah, this yeah, question yeah, exactly uh, okay uh, professor chairman uh, again, to the tricky questions, and if we can answer it, we will solve the problem, and, <laughs> and we will close down the cup. But it's actually, when we try to, to interlink uh, science, uh, technology, and climate change, uh, just we can refer to every single aspect of life. Speaking about transportation, simply, we used to wait for the, uh, for the bus or for the shuttle as long as it will come and simply by advancing the introduction of application, simply like this. We, we, we shortened the distance, we shortened the time, and as well as we shortened the emission. Because the bus normally wait for us to come and then leave at a certain time. Nowadays, we can just frequently jump in to jump out by the uh, application. Uh, in agriculture, we used to buy all the agriculture uh, waste and then uh, sometimes we will be amazed to having uh, a rain in the middle of summer and all of the, our agriculture is spoiled. But depending on artificial intelligence and internet of things, we can have a prediction uh, how the weather is going to be and then we can uh, uh, increase our resilience, the terminology we look forward. And to also, when we finish the uh, harvesting the crop, all the waste we can then transfer it by recycling into some other useful ways instead of putting more carbon and uh, uh, doing emissions from the waste. Uh, let me speak it uh, in my field, actually, the marine. Uh, we used to have uh, uh, vehicles, uh, marine vehicles operated by a lowest degree of uh, diesel, but nowadays it's turned to be uh, uh, operated on solar panels as well as wind turbine uh, that can move uh, huge vehicles, huge uh, vessels. And by reducing this amount of emissions, we are curbing uh, the, the carbon and we increase our resilience as a community. So by all the invention is related somehow to curbing the carbon release. For example, nowadays they are speaking about we do not need to go and hoover all the plant field or all the agriculture in Sudan. Uh, simply by using a drone, with the drone uh, equipped with high definition camera, it can move around, take the photos by artificial intelligence, identify what sort of microbes they might infected be, and even find the uh, uh, optimum uh, cure assembly wises and we will reduce all the cost and the emission associated with identifying the disease in every single of uh, means of life even in water treatment 
we nowadays we are depending used to depend on uh, 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 different type of desalination nowadays we are working in ro and even beyond the ro which is some sort of membrane so it's the technology is giving us the opportunity to reduce our emission but with a little bit higher cost at the beginning and this is related to the first session we need an inclusive offers from the bank to support the uh, resilient or innovative solution to curb down the emission so it's all related scientists come with a solution but to implement the solution we need some so banking uh, solution for this thank you very much i think it is a quite interesting explanation and i learned a lot from it by the way i'm not a scientist like you but i'm still getting information here and there. Now I think it's a time to... Have you, how, how many films, Adil, uh, or uh, presentation, I mean? Ahmed. Ahmed? Huh? Yes, please. First, uh, I'm happy to hear that we do have a scientist in the Arab region like you guys. You're doing a great job. My question is this. Who is financing whatever you do? Second, how can you know private sector government invest in what you're doing? You know, re recycling, using all the carbon emission, agriculture. We have to. Uh, if there is you know, an, an investor who, how can you know private sector and government help such an innovation? You know. Okay, assembly. I will ask, and then I will give you the floor. Uh, <laughs> Nowadays, every university, in, I'm speaking about the uh, Arabian region because we are more or less affiliated with other agencies working on the Arabian region. Uh, in a couple of uh, weeks, I'm traveling to Yemen because we are trying to implement some sort of solar panel there for uh, uh, water uh, uh, extraction and water desalination. Uh, so I guess uh, at every institution and university, now we have what we call it the foreign office. And the foreign office is like a technical office that can uh, present the latest finding of the university uh, to be exposed to uh, potential funders. Uh, and uh, the first thing is to, to link or to have like an entrance to this office where you can find and scroll down all the inventions or all the advanced or breakthrough. Uh, second thing is we have the uh, capability of applying for a joint research, which actually it's one uh, major source of funding for myself and my group uh, of students and colleagues. Uh, we successfully won uh, uh, three consecutive projects from uh, uh, Italian cooperation, uh, Brema Foundation in the Middle East, and uh, Erasmus to, to, to uh, establish a master degree program for climate change. And recently, like uh, one week ago, we received the recognition from the Minister of Higher Education in Egypt because we came up with an idea uh, to link the artificial intelligence to find a solution for uh, coral bleaching, as coral is one of the major income source for Egypt from tourism, uh, from other uh, Caribbean countries, from Sudan, Sungunab, Dungunab, uh, from all over of the tropical areas, they have uh, coral reef, and uh, climate change will have a major impact on coral reef. So just link uh, the uh, health of coral reef with an artificial tool, or what we call it, um, uh, application, we can find a solution. Every single f uh, fisherman, they can send us a report how the coral reef looks like. If we are five specialists only in Sudan, then we have 2,000 fishermen, so we are now 2,005. And if we link it and extend it to the divers, so it's, this is what we call citizen science. And nowadays, it's increasing activity in the Arab world. Okay, so it's you. quite interesting that you read the issue of your work in, the, in, in Yemen. Akfan has got a bank <laughs> called the Al Amal Bank. It's doing a lot on uh, digitalization uh, as well as uh, solar energy and i think uh, we can think about uh, looking seriously of how we can uh, cooperate together since you are both of us are in yemen now yes please okay uh, for the same question uh, actually many thanks mr nasser for your question um, actually it's all the bit how can as a scientist uh, contribute and uh, 
uh, engage with industry. Uh, I think the only uh, key, uh, uh, key parameter is the funder. Uh, because at, at the end, uh, uh, there are problems. Uh, this problem coming from uh, unwisdom consumption for our uh, resources uh, and is, it, it, big, it, it make big max and uh, uh, to sort out this mess uh, someone uh, need to spend money uh, without fund uh, no solution will uh, sort out uh, the assembly actually uh, even in your home, if you someone make mess, you, you will spend time, spend the effort, spend money to to sort out this. Uh, this is a same same situation. We are going to our research uh, centers for incomes, uh, uh, and this income come from funders, and this, uh, the, the money come from funders because he interests in technology and uh, he try to help a community and. Uh, and the government also. Uh, in uh, related to our project, we have like uh, nine projects until now, uh, funded uh, from British Council, uh, SDF in Egypt, uh, uh, Newton uh, Fund. Um, uh, most of them are R&D projects, so uh, we handle a problem uh, and uh, offer solution, and uh, we also uh, product. Uh, like uh, model from uh, from the this, this solution to uh, implement in, in, in the society uh, to show uh, that can work and can scale up and let uh, the decision to the uh, investor and the governments if they want to scale up this model they can do it in large projects. Um, after I return back to show some of this uh, achievement in, in our videos, uh, but I need to let uh, my colleague uh, answer the same question first. Thank you, Mr. Sherman. It's a good question, and, and um, really I can reflect on this from uh, the, 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 the long time that I lived in the U.S., more than 32 years now, and uh, my capacity as the head of the, the departments, it's the burden very much on my shoulder to find sources for funding research, funding, students' activities, and on and on. Uh, I think the key is to uh, get the industry involved in a way that they have and they feel that they have ownership through partnership, through partnering. Having an advisory board from the industry working with the departments and with the university and with the college, and it's through advisory board in the sense that they again they have the sense of ownership they meet with the students they hear the research ideas from the faculty I meet with my advisory board once a month which is shows how dedicated and how interested they are they are all of them are very successful businessmen they are CEOs of companies presidents of companies they come we have a program we have students or more, they talk about um, potential projects like the ones that we heard yesterday, um, uh, very interesting projects we heard yesterday and the, the, uh, the prizes. Um, uh, we have Engineers Without Borders um, student chapter, they travel to South America because it's closer to us, they have, they work on projects, real projects, addressing water issues, sanitation issues, poverty issues in, in small towns in South Africa. So the funds, they, they, the students, we give them in, 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 some kind of incentives. If they raise up uh, uh, $1,000, we'll help them with another $1,000. And the advisory board, usually they support them. Uh, they hear their presentation and their proposal. Uh, same thing with research. The faculty, the young faculty especially, they come, they propose an idea and they, they have a sponsor from the industry, so when they write the proposal to, to a public agency or to a funding agency, they show the support that this is a needed research and there is some matching coming from the industry. So again, the partnership between the funding agencies and the uh, private uh, sector 
the academic side, all of this together really create this kind of sense of a team, having a team and uh, uh, common goals. Um, we, we have events every year, for example, major luncheon attended by 200, 300 people, sponsors, they sponsor tables, and we give an award. Every year we give an award, an Excellence in Engineering Award. And the awardee will, usually a, a very distinguished figure, will come and give uh, a keynote speech, and we raise money from events like that every year. So many things like that which involve engaging the industry, engaging the private sector in the research and the students' activities side uh, help really to raise funds and raise awareness. Uh, before you answer the question, in fact, I have been thinking yesterday while we were in the prize ceremony, why not Akfan can have a small prize annual for uh, young scientists in terms of uh, their development in financial inclusion and SDG. So it can be attached to this prize, so it can be two prizes in one event. I mean, uh, the, the proposal is left for you, uh, Mr. Nasser, to think about it. Please go ahead. Like this. Okay, so may I push the right back. So, first of all, um, Mr. Nasser, thank you very much for your question. So, I think you know our colleagues already gave pretty uh, reasonable answer to your question. But in addition to basically, uh, from my perspective and also you know my own experience, uh, I'm coming from UK. So basically, in the UK, there is a significant now investment on mitigating the effect of the climate change and mainly the UK government is actually doing this by investing towards renewable energy resources. And basically the government is driving this but also at the same time, both actually both in the UK and also throughout Europe now, the industry sees also a big business case basically in this particular uh, field as well. So, Basically, currently it is, it is from my uh, research activities, you know, we receive funding mainly from government, but also at the same time, as I said, as the private sector is, their interest is keep increasing, I think the, our income coming from the private sector will increase as well. So that's kind of our experience. Uh, your interesting questions uh, remind me with uh, 20 years ago when I was taking my master's degree from Blemis University and my potential supervisor at that time said, okay, Tarek, we are going to have uh, uh, an introduction meeting tomorrow. So you prepare your plan and come and present it in front of uh, the stakeholders. And I didn't know why, because we do not have such thing in Egypt. And before the thing, cool down, no problem, just if nobody is adopt your idea, you have to change it, simply like this. And I went there, and I started discussing my idea, and I was in Blemos at this house, and all of a sudden, uh, I found someone at the end of the queue. Okay, this is a brilliant idea, we are going to take you to do your uh, uh, thesis on this, and they were the water authority in Liverpool, in the north. So, my, my uh, fellow from Plymouth, they didn't like my idea, but other people from Liverpool, they uh, like it, and they found me to go to Liverpool and do all the research needed at Liverpool University. So as you mentioned, sir, it's really very valuable questions. If we just, and uh, as uh, Dr. Osama mentioned, simply, the magic word, uh, link all of our activities, not only for the sake of academia, but for the sake of being implemented and applied. Link it with the need for industry, for the trade, and we will find a lot of ideas coming. Returning to your uh, comment, sorry I am against you, 
do not say it's only for young people. What about the middle-aged people? I am very old. So when you try to declare a prize, please uh, let it open so everyone can participate. Maybe an old man like me can apply. What is a nice idea? <laughs> Thank you. All depends on Mr. Nasser, you know, uh, how he can put it uh, in practice. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I think uh, I have a couple of questions, but I think uh, we need to change the mood now. Ahmed, <laughs> uh, not here, but uh, if if anyone has a remote control to uh, Ahmed to play the first video, please. Video. Ahmed, could you please uh, play the first video, please? Um, actually, uh, uh, what I need to pre present today is a video from one of our projects, R&D uh, &D project between UK and Egypt. Uh, we all know that uh, climate change problem impacts the water resources, so the solution uh, uh, in desalination. And if we make desalination with uh, 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 powered by fossil fuels will increase the problem of climate change. So, to uh, power a uh, desalination planet with uh, marine renewable energy is the idea of this project. It's an uh, offshore uh, or first offshore uh, desalination planet. It's uh, 10,000 uh, cubic meter per day and can upgrade to 60,000 also. Uh, this uh, combined project between Strasclyde University and Desert Research Center in Egypt, uh, led by Professor Arkan Otrakus and me and uh, Dr. Aselda, and uh, from Egyptian side, uh, Professor Hossam Shawi and his team, uh, we uh, managed to design the offshore structure with the renewable energy production. It's uh, this uh, one of uh, our winter pine. It uh, provides three megawatt per hour, uh, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, solar panel uh, on the sun deck of uh, the offshore structure. And uh, in the working deck, if we see now uh, six uh, units of desalination, each one can produce 2,000 uh, meter cube per uh, hour. Uh, it's innovation design. We offer this design and uh, make uh, model, small model, five uh, meter cube per day. Uh, it's uh, produced in Egypt and uh, commercial now uh, in commercial phase also. And we try to make a patent of this design. Uh, as we see uh, from the, our design, it's uh, uh, all of them share the same uh, inlet. And uh, this innovation, because when you make uh, uh, a desalination uh, planet on uh, onshore, uh, in parallel way, you need huge space. You, you need more uh, pipeline uh, to transfer uh, the water uh, uh, from inlet to outlet. Uh, and of course, you will need more power uh, to, uh, to the uh, high pressure pump. Uh, but in, in this design, uh, it's less in uh, uh, pipeline uh, and less in power uh, production or power needed. Uh, this is the inlet of water coming from down, uh, down point of the planet uh, in the filter, sand filter and uh, disk filter. Uh, this also um, save uh, the power uh, to transfer the, the water from the inlet uh, by uh, pumps because it's uh, naturally uh, coming uh, from the uh, end point of the planet. Um, actually, this design has a mobility, so it can transfer depend on the demon. So, for example, if some place suffer uh, as there are emergency, emergency situation, you can transfer this uh, pilot plant to this area. 
uh, to produce water and after that you can transfer it to another area and so on. Uh, also, uh, you can also save the, in your investment in the land because uh, in, in the coastal city, uh, the land is very, very high uh, uh, value. So uh, to make something uh, offshore, you can save your investment. So this simple idea, uh, this is a second idea actually uh, about floating uh, BV. Maybe I let uh, Professor Arkani speak about this idea. Thank you very much, Sam. So basically, this is the other project that we are uh, currently working on with Porsait University in Egypt. So this basically particle project focusing on developing a novel uh, floating solar energy system for uh, Egyptian and lakes, especially in at north side of Egypt. So uh, this is a particular design working in a way that, you know, uh, it is first of all floating. So why floating rather than actually putting them on based onshore? Because this particle system requires cooling system. So basically by just locating this particular design in a floating environment, so basically you automatically get this uh, cooling system in place. And also at the same time, you know, in addition to energy production, this particular actual system reduces the evaporation of water. So basically we are not just producing water, but also we are kind of contributing the reduction of basically water consumption from the lakes uh, in Egypt. You know, it is basically from a technological point of view, it has some nice aspects, tracking sun and things like that, like it has some automation facilities and so on, but in simple terms, basically, this particular design is helping us to produce energy, that's the one thing, but also at the same time, we are trying to give this energy to the rural areas. So basically, we are contributing to the development of the rural communities. So it's not just basic technology itself, but also we are contributing to the development of the community. I think this is also an important part, aspect of this, this type of projects that we are very much actually somehow working or enjoying working basically with our partners in Egypt. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any, any other uh, presentation? Okay. I think we have got a uh, very short time now left and I will uh, switch from the thing you know and you are well explained to the thing we know and we want you to contribute, which is a financial inclusion and SDG. What type of a science you think, or you have made, I don't know, or you have known about, that can help financial inclusion in terms of, uh, apart from solar energy, or uh, mobile banking, or anything that can, can help in providing financial services like insurance, like remittances, like credits, like uh, follow-up of credits and the payment for the from the clients and all these type of things. What about the future room for this type of scientific, small scientific approach that can help uh, financial inclusion, especially in the rural areas and especially in the vulnerable groups and small in the small uh, smallholders small agriculture? I know the question is very open. <laughs> but your input will be very valuable to us, by the way. Uh, our experience now in Egypt, we are trying to increase, uh, not race to zero, but we are trying to uh, race to resilience. And on our uh, way to do so, uh, we just uh, try to equip the isolated community with uh, self-generating uh, tools. For example, we are now adopting what we call it integrated fish farming. Mm -hmm. Integrated fish farming is simply uh, we integrate all of this uh, uh, presented technology together in one uh, solution. Uh, we depend on solar panels uh, to, to provide the source of energy mm -hmm. and we extract the water from the well and then we do simple RO mixed with sand filter because RO normally uh, needs a lot of maintenance and uh, uh, high uh, uh, prices. But we, when we mix it with sand filter, we take all of uh, the uh, carbon and nutrient away. And then we make this water go through uh, a fish farm. Uh, 
uh, all the fishes uh, enjoy the clean water, and then we take the water out from the fish farm, get it again into hydroponic system where we cultivate some sort of vegetables, and then return back to the uh, sand filter. This is very useful uh, 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 community based, uh, especially for isolated villages. So they are going to grow their own vegetables, they are going to have their own protein, they are going to have the source of energy, and on the contrary, they can have surplus of the energy, they can sell it if they can connect to uh, the grid. And thus, uh, by applying this, you can assure the uh, financial inclusion for this uh, 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 signal or segment of the citizen. And also, uh, we, we did apply something different through NGOs in Egypt nowadays, which is uh, 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 doing all of the waste, returning it into as uh, uh, an input and raw materials. Especially, we have balmetry in Egypt. We have a huge amount of balmetry. And we used to suffer from, uh, because palm trees need to be reclaimed every year yeah. to cut all of the old uh, leaves. And uh, a huge amount of waste is generated. And normally, we used to burn it. And we have the smoke and everything. But nowadays, we just introduce a simple means by drying these leaves and turn it into threads. And these threads can be used uh, in waving of various things. And so instead of having emissions, we, we now have a product, you can sell it. And also you can uh, assure the inclusion of this community with their own uh, uh, sustainable uh, economy, depend on uh, not only the bomb dates, the dates itself, but only, uh, also on the waste generated. Uh, uh, for example, now also, and by introducing the scientists, we came across something really amazing. We have, uh, uh, in the lifetime of the date, you have a lot of unripe dates, which fall down the tree. Yeah. And is this unripe dates worth nothing? But if you dry it and you convert it with the sort of fermentation, you are going to have a very valuable product. So if the one kilogram of a normal date worth like 100 Egyptian pound, uh, one kilogram of the product of this is worth like 1,000 USD. So it's totally different story. As I mentioned in the earlier intervening, it's depend on the uh, uh, specific uh, solution you present, depend on the need of your community. Exactly. Uh, exactly. And this is, uh, I, I guess, the magic word to find or to solve any problem. This is really uh, one of the university uh, industry integration. I like that. And by the way, I know that uh, Egypt has got uh, a long-term uh, climate change uh, strat uh, you know, strategy, which I think uh, going up to th uh, 2030 or 2050, I can't remember. Is this 30? Are these things are included in that strategy or not? I know it's a critical question. <laughs> Because I like, I like what they said, and I think it should be included, because we are looking from the financial inclusion perspective of the strategy. Huh? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, about your question. Um, actually, um, uh, from my opinion, my uh, opinion is that investment in uh, uh, NOx, uh, energy, uh, water, and food is a uh, priority for them. Uh, and uh, that's because actually we want to follow uh, uh, Paris Agreement uh, to keep uh, uh, the temperature 1.5 uh, and uh, the temperature coming from uh, carbon dioxide and the carbon dioxide coming from uh, fossil fuel, so uh, to um, uh, convert to renewable energy, we can uh, stop preventing uh, 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 preventing the uh, carbon dioxide. This is the first solution. The second, uh, uh, our resources from water is very limited. Uh, a simple fact, like 700 uh, million uh, people uh, by 2030. Uh, can be displacement from their uh, 
uh, places uh, due to drought. So the next huge challenge is uh, resources of water. Uh, and we need to face uh, this problem by produce or uh, uh, non-conventional uh, resources of this water uh, by uh, uh, treatment to the water or uh, desalination and or other product of uh, water. The third is food, of course, because now when the temperature rises, uh, some uh, uh, crab is beginning to uh, yield or uh, the yield of this crab decrease uh, at least 10% or 11% uh, for some statistics. So we need to increase the production of uh, our food. So this is a priority for our uh, next uh, research uh, to follow up uh, the NOx. Okay, thank you. I think the key is uh, just one word, and we need to do more of it, especially here in Egypt, which is PPP. P3, public private partnership. I think this is a key to uh, advance uh, ambitious projects, uh, reduce uh, the national debt, uh, and uh, have again sense of ownership with the private sector to everything we do. Uh, the US they started to do a lot of this. Europe is even more advanced and ahead of everyone else when it comes to uh, P3 projects. Um, and you can, like, again, PPP, it's basically, it's investments. Every party, they invest, nothing for free. And so in the infrastructure world, uh, when they have a PPP project for a highway, uh, then this highway will uh, kind of uh, uh, produce and generate uh, funds and generate profit that can be shared by the uh, private sector for a certain period of time. Uh, this will advance also technologies and also advance if even um, you can have uh, uh, conditions for uh, some kind of like uh, um, uh, climate or environmentally friendly designs and environmentally friendly uh, materials. Uh, you mentioned something about turning the, um, the, 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 the like the, the biomaterial to threads. Uh, we have we do something similar, turning old um, uh, rubber from the tires to be used for as part of the aggregate for concrete, for example, and use old concrete again to be recycled again and used to use it for repaving the the roads. So all of these are wonderful ideas that will have financial benefits as well as environmental benefits. And this is a win-win for everybody, yeah. Okay, so same question. So basically, yeah. I think my colleagues already uh, gave pretty nice, nice answers, but maybe if I want to add something. So I think it's not fair to just to put Egypt on the spot because at the end of the day, you know, we need to be a little bit more realistic in a sense that we are not living in an ideal world. So basically, by just realizing that, okay, you know, we have this climate change issue and so on, at the end of the day, it's not the only problem that we are dealing with, or governments are dealing with. So for example, uh, as my uh, colleague mentioned, you know, for example, Europe is really much now currently investing in renewable energy type of basically uh, resources. So, but also at the same time, all of a sudden, you know, the war between Russia and uh, Ukraine started, and they start burning coal, you know, which is actually opposite to what actually Europe was proposing before. As you see, you know, we need to be a little bit realistic and look at, you know, how the things are developing, and we need to be a little bit more patient as well, so that, you know, we need to be aware of the problem, and, you know, as the time progresses, as things are becoming more and more better, so we can tackle this question in a much better manner. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I did a research uh, trying to see the uh, differences between our, uh, Arab countries in terms of uh, regulations uh, for financial inclusion. Egypt is uh, one of the best three, and I am very happy because they are paving the way for this uh, microfinance and financial inclusion 
sector to flourish. Now I'm looking forward for Egypt to create financial inclusive bankable projects that mostly related to climatic change that a lot of countries can really benefit from, especially in the Arab world yani, and the Amina region. Uh, I think this is possible, is it, within the, the science and technology? Uh, in uh, regard to what you just mentioned, uh, uh, in the Egyptian strategy for climate change and beyond, uh, before the declaration of the strategy, which took place early this year, uh, Egypt uh, uh, launched uh, what we call it green bonds. And green bonds, uh, it was for 700 million USD, and uh, it was linked to a green project in Egypt, including water desalination, inc including uh, 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 regenerative agriculture, including all sorts that can reduce emission, including uh, building of uh, recycling factories for solid waste, because solid waste in Egypt is, uh, is a major problem. Is the improper handling of the solid waste contribute to climate change with around from 8 to 14 percent of the uh, carbon dioxide emission. Uh, so Egypt uh, identified the problem and they tried to solve the problem through uh, implementation of this new factory. Also, a tip for ACFAND uh, to, to do it in the Arab world as well as uh, with our African uh, colleagues, uh, invest in nature-based solution. Nature-based solution is the first borderline that we need to enhance and to go beyond. Nature-based solution include uh, 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 assuring uh, sustainable fisheries for the local community, assuring uh, cultivation of mangroves so you have a product you can sell, assuring capture of carbon dioxide, assuring uh, work for local community, so nature-based solution is really a very good working strategy, and it's implemented in Kenya, uh, Tanzania, uh, Vietnam, uh, Thailand. A lot of places now embrace the nature-based solution, and I believe with such connectivity and networking as you already have, we can support such a, a project. Uh, back to nature is the first thing we can do to uh, increase our resilience towards the negative impact of climate change. Uh, I really hope that uh, such kind of scientists who are really are proud of to work more on financial inclusion because this is the most needed area and I think that poverty cannot, we cannot get rid of poverty without helping the poor themselves to be uh, economically active and science is one way in, uh, in addition to finance uh, is another way to to, to achieve this goal. Thank you very much, and we hope we can stay more than that. But before doing that, any question from the floor, please? He's telling me that time is over. Adil, has you got anything? Stas Nasser? Okay. The four doctors. Thank you. Full stop. <laughs> okay. <laughs>